Let's talk about four things that we're used to seeing and doing in medieval and fantasy games, which you absolutely can't practically do in reality. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. So we're going to be looking at medieval technology, weapons, arms and armour, and things which we're used to doing in gaming, particularly video gaming, but this does uh, extrapolate to things like role-playing games as well, um, that we're used to doing and taking advantage of in those kind of scenarios that really just don't work in reality. They don't work in the real medieval world. They don't work with real arms and armour, real weapons and equipment. And particularly in gaming, these are things that we're so used to doing that we totally take them for granted. And this means that when we're looking at historical periods, um, dealing with um, arms and armour um, of the day, that quite simply, a lot of these things we just don't even think about how they were actually done. We don't question them because we're so used to them working a certain way uh, within the games that we play. Um, and they just don't, they just can't really work um, in those ways in reality. And we're going to look at why. But before I go into these four things that just don't really work in the real world that we're completely used to in gaming, I want to have a little word quickly about our sponsors who are Raid Shadow Legends. Have you taken on the Demon Lord or crushed the Ice Golem yet? Have you penetrated the Doom Tower? What about fighting millions of other human players in the arena? Well, if you haven't done any of those things, now's the time to get your life in order and play Raid. With hundreds of artifacts and over 500 champions, the options are countless. You can fight Raid any way you like with your own tactics. You can download Raid for free and play for free right now using my link below or the QR code on the screen. And you can play it on your PC or your mobile. Can you believe over 76 million people have played Raid? Which is crazily almost four times the entire metropolitan area of New York. And Raid's been played all over the world in 195 countries. And in total, those people have played Raid for over 12 and a half billion hours. Uh, quick bit of maths, that's nearly one and a half million years. Or you know enough to travel to Mars and back over 1.25 million times. So what I personally love the most about Raid is playing in the arena battles against other human players. That's my absolute favourite. I love improving my dungeon time and I quite enjoy upgrading my characters as well. So this month's Raid has got a whole bunch of new summer activities. We've got a fusion event to get a brand new legendary champion, various tournaments to fight against other players. They're also releasing five brand new characters, which look really awesome and I can't wait to get hold of them myself. Raid's summer plans are just heating up, so there's never been a better time to get started than now. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is click the link below my video here or the scan the QR code, and you'll get one epic champion called Chonaru, who's amazing in the Doom Tower. Also 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get into the game. All of these rewards will be waiting for you up here in the inbox. These rewards are only for new players and only for the next 30 days and if you're quick enough you can find me in game under the name Captain Context and you can join my clan. And it's that easy, hopefully see you in game. So thanks for sticking with me, now let's get back to these four points. I'm going to run through them as concisely as I possibly can. So the first point is one which really annoys me in gaming, and that is the question of pole arms. Now, for those of you who don't know if you're new to this channel, pole arms are super, super important. They're, they're one of the most important categories of weapon on the battlefield. We could say that medieval battles, and indeed we could say this of the ancient era as well, Roman and Greek and so on, um, the, essentially there are two most important categories of weapons on the battlefield. There are pole arms and then there are missile weapons. More about missile weapons in a little bit. I'm just going to take my helmet off. Now, um, Pole arms are super, super important. They're long reach. They work very well in formations. There are different types of pole arms. Obviously, spears, one of the most predominant type of weapons for the whole of history, actually, um, and in the form of the bayonet, even until the age of gunpowder. And then there's other weapons like two-handed axes and halberds and uh, two-handed swords. Um, perhaps you could categorise almost in the uh, area of pole arms as well because they can't be worn in a uh, sheath or scabbard uh, like a normal sidearm. So they're super, super important. But there's one thing in gaming which absolutely people are used to which just doesn't work in reality. And that is when you put this pole arm away, when you stop using this for whatever reason, uh, say for example you want to use a sword because you're going into a building and you can't deploy a large pike or spear or halberd inside a building and you go in with a sword or even a dagger, 
then you're going in there with a short range weapon. That, that is the more appropriate weapon for that uh, purpose. What do you do with the pole arm? <laughs> well, quite simply, what we're used to in gaming terms is either the pole arm um, disappears and reappears at will, or we wear it on our back. And that's right, this is, this is the one that really, really gets me. And I've spoken about this in previous videos. I know regular viewers will know my uh, annoyance with this one. And so our character runs around on screen wearing a whopping great pole arm on the back. Now, this doesn't work for a whole bunch of reasons. Firstly, there's no way to keep it there. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a large magnetic or magical force keeping it suspended uh, on the back. Uh, it looks really stupid on screen, I think, um, probably partly because it's not something that could actually happen. Um, but additionally, we can deploy it and undeploy it. We can put it on the back and off the back, uh, pretty much like that, with a, with a roll of the of the mouse wheel or a click of a button. And this is, of course, complete rubbish. It's just there's just no reality to it at all. But also think about the practicalities of wearing something. I mean, this isn't even a particularly long spear. This is, in spear terms, relatively short. But even this relatively short spear, imagine the um, annoyance and uh, problems of wearing this on your back. There's probably even some things you haven't thought of. So obvious things like the bottom end and the top end are going to catch on things. Branches if you're anywhere near woods. Uh, doorways if you're anywhere near buildings or eaves um, of roofs and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Other people's things that they're holding, if other people are next to you, you're going to be bashing them and hitting them with your pole arm. If they're holding uh, long weapons, then this is going to conflict with their long weapons as well. But another thing that you maybe didn't think about was that if this is on your back, okay, so that is now a, a rigid rod stuck on your back here, and say, for example, you are fighting at the time with your sword. You're swinging your sword around, but you've got a pole sticking off your back. And I tell you, it's very, very common uh, to move the sword around this angle around here, and it's going to collide with that pole arm on your back. Um, now, that's that's all clear, hopefully, to you, and I'm sure that most of you agree with me on this point. That's just on foot, and uh, most people don't ride horses, but obviously in medieval warfare, a lot of people did ride horses. And so on horseback, there's a whole other issue, how do you wear this on your back? Now, just before um, a few people who know a little bit of information about this jump in and go, ah, but Matt, Indeed, there have been at various points in history ways of suspending pole arms while you're on a horse so that you can do something else like shoot a bow, operate a firearm, reload, that kind of stuff. So indeed, there have been a few isolated examples, but generally speaking, there is no way uh, in, the terms, in terms of most spears or lances of having any way of holding this on horseback once you let go of it, okay? as I say, with a few rare exceptions. So, if you're playing a video game where you say, for example, you have a lance and you have a bow, indeed the bow can sit in a sort of holster if it's a short recurve bow, as used by the Turks, for example, or the Mongols. Um, however, the lance, what are you supposed to do with the lance when you operate the bow? You can't wear it on your back. There's no, there's no like holster to slide it into because it's too long and unwieldy. Um, there may potentially be ways you could slide it in somewhere on the saddle or put it under your thigh or something weird kind of thing, but I don't know any, of, any evidence of this being done historically. So quite simply, what was normally done probably was you'd either jam it into the ground and shoot stationary, and then when you're ready to move off, pull it out of the ground and carry on, or you drop it, you abandon it. Um, so this is problematic, whether it's a naginata or a glaive or a lance, spear, whatever, um, on horseback. What do you do with it when you put it down and go to another weapon, whether it's a missile weapon like a gun or a bow or crossbow, or uh, if it's a sword? Usually you deploy the sword after the lance has been broken or embedded in an enemy and you let go of it, and then you pull the sword out and you use the sword thereafter. That's why one reason why swords not as good as lances in general, but the lance sometimes can be a one-shot weapon. Once it's in the enemy, once it's broken, then you need something else. So you need the sword as a backup. So the sword is often a backup weapon, whether you're on foot or on horseback. So as you see, there's a big problem with pole arms. Pole arms are fantastic weapons, but once you put them down to do something else, 
you might not practically be able to get them back again. And I do understand in gaming terms, that's why they, we've got this artificial thing of the pike or spear or halberd or whatever magically uh, appearing on your back and being slung there somehow. What by? What to? How is it going to stay there? How is it not going to get in the way? How are you not going to fall over it? Uh, you're not, basically. Um, so, there we go. There's my first, probably biggest and most important bugbear of something that we're totally used to in gaming, being able to put the pole arm away and magically get it out again. Pulling a pike out of your pocket, something super annoying uh, in some games. So. There we go, pole arms, once you put it down, where, where have you put it, what are you gonna do with it, how are you gonna get it back again? You can't really wear it on your back. So the next thing which works totally different in reality to how we're used to it working in gaming is the question of bows. And I would of course mention the missiles that have to go with bows and that's arrows. Now, funnily enough, there isn't a huge problem with arrows. What's uh, done with them in most gaming terms is pretty similar to reality. You wear it on your belt. Uh, as many people have pointed out, usually historically these were worn down, hanging down at hip level, not usually on the back. In movies and gaming, fantasy art, that kind of stuff, people like to have arrows on the back. Now, I'm not one of those people who says people never wore back um, quivers. In fact, back quivers did exist at various points in Japan, for example. Um, but we should point out that historically and around the world, predominantly, quivers have been worn at the hip level because that's where they're most practical for most types of people to operate, uh, to get arrows from. Um, but in terms of the um, bows themselves, obviously there are several different types of bows, many different types of bows uh, throughout history. This is a um, English style longbow, Mary Rose style longbow, lighter draw weight, but nevertheless, the same basic design. This is one of the longer bows around. There, in fact, you could say that certain Japanese bows, certain Yumi, are even longer. Um, and there have been, you know, lots of long bows around the world. But there are equally lots of short type of bows, um, particularly composite recurve bows. Turkish bows are probably amongst the smallest. And then if we go to the medium size, there's things like uh, Manchu and other Chinese um, bows recurve bows which are longer than an average Turkish bow but shorter than a longbow. So clearly we've got some parameters here but here's the general rule. So in gaming we're very used to people being able to put their bow away very very quickly, dispose of it somehow, usually it appears on the back and to be able to pull out a sword. So if you're operating a bow, someone closes in on you, you're able to go to roll your mouse wheel or click your button and ba -dum, you've now got your sword in your hand instantly, which I don't have a huge problem with because that's pretty much what uh, sheaths or scabbards are intended for. They're intended for you to be able to quickly get a sword out. But the question is, how do you quickly get the bow away? And this is my bugbear. So the difference between gaming and reality, where's the gap here? Well. In gaming, usually the bow appears somewhere else on your body, usually on the back, um, and the sword appears in your hand. Now, in reality, there are certain types of short bow which can go in a type of holster, which is worn at the side, usually connected to the um, quiver. So usually the quiver has essentially a holster in the side and you can put the short bow into it. That's fine. Um, for those particular types of short bow in those particular types of culture. Okay, so the Ottoman Turks had those, for example, the Persians had them, they were used in India and elsewhere. If you've got a long bow, that doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't work at all. In fact, even something as large as a uh, certain types of uh, Chinese recurve bow, they're too big uh, sometimes to do that with. And even if you do have one of these uh, really cool, I have to say, um, quivers that actually houses the, sh the, the recurve bow as well, you've got to bear in mind there are some consequences to wearing that. You can't run around, usually they're on horseback, uh, which is fine, but if you're on foot and you're running around with one of these, it's actually quite heavy and inconvenient, depending on how many arrows you've got left in there. If you've got a whole bunch of arrows and you've got the quiver and you've got the holster part for the bow and you've got the bow sitting in there, that's quite a large cumbersome object flapping around at your side. So there's gonna be some consequences to that. That's the first thing. But certainly if you have a long bow or any type of larger bow or you're not from a culture that has that type of bow um, holster, then what do you do with it? Well, the reality is, so if we talk about something like an English longbowman uh, of the Hundred Years' War, the Wars of the Roses, 
What do you do with your longbow when you draw out your um, sword? Well, there's a couple of options. You either keep it in your hand and go for the sword. I'm looking for my sword and I've already pulled it out. You either keep it in your hand and use it in, uh, use one in each hand. You can tuck it away. Now that is something you can do. And funnily enough, we actually see a parallel for that later in the 20th century um, in the training of, uh, particularly of Dutch um, soldiers in Indochina where they used a kliwang or a cutlass in one hand and had their rifle, carbine in fact, a short rifle, in their left hand and basically kept it out of the way. We see a similar thing anecdotally with the Gurkhas when they pull out their cookery in the 20th century that they sometimes um, seem to keep the rifle in their other hand because they don't want to drop it and it's quicker than slinging it on their back which you can do with a rifle because it's got a sling on it. Remember longbows don't have slings on them. But the other option, and probably what would have happened a lot of the time, is rather than cumbersomely trying to run around with a longbow in your hand, you probably just would have dropped it on the ground. Gaming consequence there. So if you've been using, you've been using your longbow and shooting at people and suddenly they close in on you and you want to pull out your sword, the bow's going to end up on the floor and you're going to have to go up and, and pick it back, pick it back up. Okay, you can't practically wear it and even bigger consequence, when you want to use the bow again, you need to re-access it. So it's a bit, in fact, it's very similar to the polearm question. It's not a problem having the bow or the polearm in your hand, operating it and then dropping it and pulling out your sword and fighting with your sword. The problem is when you want to go back to using the pole arm of the bow, where is it? <laughs> and this is why they invented bow, bow holsters for certain types of uh, for cultures that were very prominent in uh, mounted archery. So particularly, you know, famously the Mongols, the Persians, the Turks, ver the Ottomans, various of these people who wanted to be able to switch between weapons and still re-access the bow. You need somewhere to hold the bow. This wasn't the case, as far as we know, in most of history and for most people, certainly um, foot archers as well. So there's a massive difference between gaming and reality. When you drop the bow, you can't necessarily re-access the bow once you put it down. So for the third point that I want to list, a big disparity between what you can do in gaming and the actual reality is around armour. Now I'm just wearing a sort of arming doublet here. Um, I do have full plate harness, I'm not going to put that on for the purposes of this video, but it should be patently obvious to most people that you can't put on full plate harness, so a complete set of armour, either quickly or by yourself. So whereas in a gaming context you might be an adventurer and you might want to put your armour on, you put your armour on, um, or you take it off for different scenarios if you need to swim across a river or if you're going into town, um, or indeed if it just needs maintaining or you don't want to get rusty because it's raining, whatever. Um, so you put armour on and off, but in reality a full plate harness usually requires someone else's assistance and it takes a certain amount of time to do it. Now, perhaps a future video I could do an experiment of how quickly can I get my armour on uh, with someone's help or maybe different types of armour. That could be a fun video to do and maybe that's something we'll look at. But uh, a very simple fact is that the time it takes to put armour on, and in some cases, depending on the type of armour, the difficulty to put on, in other words, do you need one or two people to help you, has a very big effect on how history has panned out. So famously at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, um, Harold Godwinson's army, the Anglo-Saxon English army, attacked Harold Hardrada's Viking army or Norse army um, so quickly and suddenly that the Vikings didn't have time, we're told uh, in at least one source, um, didn't have time to put their armour on. And this of course had a major effect on how the battle turned out because quite simply things like helmets and mail shirts, brigandine, obviously full plate armour, have an enormous, enormous effect on your uh, ability to keep fighting um, and not get injured. Um, so quite simply, someone threw clothes, uh, you know, one little stab or cut from an edged weapon or an arrow, spear, whatever, is likely or stands a chance of putting them out of the fight. In armour, you can get hit all over the place by all sorts of weapons and it won't wound you and you can carry on fighting, so you're still a fighting unit. So if your force is wearing either no armour 
some armor or a lot of armor, it makes a huge difference to the outcome of the battle. But there's a certain amount of, as I say, preparation that is required. And in gaming terms, this is rarely factored in. Certainly in video games, this is almost never factored in. Um, and even in things like role-playing games, it's very important if you're running role-playing games, it's very important that you factor in the time that it takes to put on the armor. But also bear in mind that you have to take off the armor. You can't just go, oh, well, the players will just wear their armor all the time. You can't really do that um, for all sorts of toiletry and hygiene reasons, but also to do with practical reasons, there are some things which are either very difficult to do in armour or even very hazardous to do in armour, for example, crossing a river and things like this. Um, and armour is uncomfortable. It's, you can sleep in it, you can stay in it for certain amounts of time, but it's debilitating, very debilitating, and that has a real effect as well. Now, um, even uh, something else that you need to consider, and again, this is almost never considered in gaming or in, um, uh, in role-playing games or video games, is the fact that when you don't have the armor on, where is it? <laughs> so if you're traveling by yourself, are you carrying your armor? Do you have a pack animal to carry the armor? Is, do you have a servant uh, or do you have a wagon? Uh, where's your armor being carried? And therefore, when you need to put it on, how do you access it? And we come back to the Battle of Stamford Bridge again. Now, a helmet is probably your most important piece of armor. Protect your head. One blow on the head and you can be out for the count. But when you've got a helmet on, you can take many blows on the head and be absolutely fine. So even if your only piece of armor is a helmet, if you're not wearing it, where is it? And when you need to access it, how long does it take? Can you find it? All of that kind of stuff. Now, one thing I'll just mention about armor as well is how long it takes to put on and whether you can do it by yourself varies by armor type. So I've shown myself in a male shirt a number of times in previous videos. That's relatively quick and easy to get on. You can get a male shirt on by yourself, completely unassisted, in seconds, okay? Let's, let's say five or 10 seconds, really, if you've got it to hand. But again, if you're traveling, if you're not near your armor, you have to get to your armor to get it in order to get it on. Something that you might wear over a male shirt in later medieval periods is something like a brigandine, which has got uh, steel plates on the inside. This, is you'll notice, fastens at the front with um, straps and buckles. I can happily put this on myself. So um, I could indeed, I could dress, and this would be a, a good amount of armour for a, a, an average 15th, late 15th century soldier, would be a male shirt, a brigandine and a helmet and those three things can go together and would be a, a good average level of armor for a well-equipped billman or longbowman or something like this and i can put all of those things on relatively quickly but i still need to access them i still need to get to them wherever they're stored because i can't carry them on my on my body unless i'm wearing them um, in terms of full plate harness you need assistance so you can get on you can put on your leg harness yourself you can, at a push, depending on the design, put on the cuirass, that's you know, the breastplate and backplate and the fold, the skirt bit that goes around here yourself. You cannot usually, certainly I've never had a harness where I could, uh, you cannot put on your arm armour yourself, okay? And you can put in your helmet yourself in, in most cases, although in some cases you might need assistant putting, assistance putting the helmet on as well once you've got the armour armor on and the pauldrons, depending on the type of helmet. Um, so... Huge variety in armour, but a big difference between gaming and reality is that number one, you can't just magically put armour on with the click of a button. It takes time. It has consequences to wearing it with weight and, and uh, fatigue and heat, very important heat as well, uh, and not being able to do certain things very well in armour, like swimming. Um, and in addition, if you don't have your armor on and you need to put your armor on, as well as it taking time, you need to get to it. Where is it? Where is it being stored? How is it being transported? So something to think about there for gaming, whether it's video gaming or indeed for role-playing games. So the final, the fourth um, thing, which is a big difference between gaming and reality, is around shields. Now, shields are super, super useful things. Um, and have been around for a lot of human history. Even cultures that didn't develop a shield per se had things like parrying sticks as well, which fulfill a similar function. Shields can defend actively or they can defend passively. In other words, you can actually use them for, uh, for moving to, to defend incoming blows. 
obviously you can hit people with them as well or indeed just having them there even if you're just carrying the thing um, in front of you then if arrows and other missiles or thrown you know spears are coming your way then obviously it blocks off a lot of the avenues to that weapon injuring you um, just because it's in front of you like a barrier. So hugely useful things, they are fight changers. Someone with just a shield versus someone with a sword and shield. The person with the sword and shield in general has a big advantage. Super useful in formation fighting as well because you can produce things like shield walls or the famous Roman testudo, which means you can advance on the enemy who might be throwing uh, missiles at you, spears, javelins, or shooting arrows or sling stones at you means you can basically close down the distance with those uh, missile troops or go up to a wall in order to assault the wall and try and scale the wall and that kind of stuff. So shields are battlefield changers and in many cases I would argue for example the Romans their primary weapon is the large Roman scutum, the secondary weapon really is the gladius and the pilum as well. Um, the most important element to the Roman army fighting like the Roman army did was the fact that they had these very large shields. Now Where's the big difference with gaming? Well, quite simply, in gaming terms, much like the pole arms and the bows, you either are using a thing or you're not using a thing. And the question is here, what happens to the thing when you're not using it? Well, it depends very much on the shield. So if we imagine a gaming scenario here where for whatever reason you want to put your shield down, maybe because you want to use a bow or you want to use a piece of siege machinery or um, uh, open something, you know, use both your hands, whatever, you put the shield down, okay? Or do you wear it? Well, that's the point, isn't it? So in gaming terms, what normally happens, so with a shield like this, sort of Anglo-Saxon Viking era boss grip shield, if you're holding it, you're holding it in your hand. If you want to put it down, what do you do with it? Well, you put it down. <laughs> you put it down on the ground. There's no other way of holding it. There's, um, there's not a lot of evidence that most of these shields had any sort of strapping on them and they didn't wear anything. They couldn't just kind of put them over their back and hook them onto something most of the time. Okay, they didn't do that. So what did they do with it? Presumably, they just put them down on the ground and then went back and got it again when they needed it. So um, in gaming terms, these would normally appear on the back, okay? And I'll talk a bit more about that. Now, I'm not saying, unlike with the pole arms, for example, I'm not saying that that is per se wrong for all shields because, indeed, uh, particularly in later periods, we get many shields have what is called a gige or a strap essentially, whereby, hurrah, you can wear the thing. And this is shown really relatively early. Um, almost certainly this, this was a thing actually in antiquity with certain types of shield, perhaps even with the hoplite shield. Um, and uh, it wasn't a thing with Roman shields, as far as we know, but we do know that Roman shields were sometimes worn on the back when they were traveling with packs. So they would somehow hang it on their backpack, but that's not something you can quickly deploy or put away. That's something that needs to be kind of tied up. And they even had covers, rain covers for their shields as well. Uh, but if we look at the Bayer Tapestry 1066, we do indeed see uh, house cars and various other people with shields on their back. In that case, they are doing it so that they can provide some extra protection on their backs or perhaps have a shield if they need to advance on archers. And so it frees up both of their hands to use the big house, famous house carl Dane axes in two hands. So there are numerous reasons why you might want to put a shield down, but obviously not drop it because you want to have it there. If you're a house carl using a two-handed axe and suddenly sh there's some Norman archers over there who are starting to shoot at us, what you'll probably do at that point, if you try not to knock my microphone off, is unsling, unsling your shield, okay? And at that point, you can advance on the archers um, close enough that you can now um, throw the shield at them or drop the shield and charge in with your Dane axe. So there's all sorts of reasons why you might want to have a shield. Indeed, you might be having a sword as well. So you might switch, you might drop the Dane axe and go for sword and shield, because that might be more appropriate for the opponent you're fighting. But rather than therefore saying that slinging shields on the back is wrong in gaming terms, because it's not if you have a gige. But what you have to remember is that depends on the type of shield. So the first thing I'm saying is, does your particular shield have a gige strap on it? Okay, and it can only be put on the back if it has a gige strap. If it's a boss grip Viking shield, or if it's a boss grip Roman um, scutum, you can't hang it on your back. You certainly can't quickly put it on your back and then quickly get it off again because you don't have any way of doing that. You can only do that with specific shields, okay? 
If you're using one of those specific shields, hurrah, you can do that. You can do exactly what they do in the video games. You can sling the shield in the back. You can use a two-handed weapon or run more quickly or whatever you want to do. And then you can unsling the shield and get it back up again. So there's an example on this final one where actually the gaming is a bit wrong for some types of shields, but can actually be right for certain types of shield that have the gear strap. But here's the rub, okay? Here's the thing which doesn't take, uh, get taken into consideration. Remember how I pointed out that when you try and wear a spear on your back, even if there was any way of doing that, when you try and wear your spear on the back, it has consequences. And the consequences are, a, it's a huge impediment, okay? It's in the way. You've got a pole sticking on your back. Imagine trying to walk around with a massive great pole on your back. And now, this is not as bad for shields, but it is worth mentioning. The fact is that when you put, especially a big shield like this Norman Kite Shield, when you put this on your back, it has consequences. It means that you can't quite fight as nimbly um, for example, with your two-handed axe, as if you didn't have a shield on your back. Now, it's all about trade-off. It might be worth it because it might mean that those arrows coming your way, you're protected from them because you've got a big shield on your back, a bit like a ninja turtle. Um, so, so, but absolutely, you have to remember that when you're trying to use weapons with a great big board on your back, it has consequences in that it does reduce your nimbleness, it's an added weight, it's a bit of a, it gets in the way a bit, it's likely to catch on things, particularly if it's a longer shield. So think about these consequences, um, and it's much the same as um, trying to use, for example, a cutting pole arm on horseback. Yes, you can do it. Yes, people did use naginata and glaive and various other, even sometimes two-handed swords on horseback, but you're using both your hands, you're twisting your hips and your body in such a way that isn't very conducive to good horse riding. Uh, you're going to be giving strange messages to the horse. So there's consequences. There's always a trade-off. You don't only gain. So when you're thinking about whether it's video gaming or role-playing gaming, you might think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have a halberd, I'm going to have a spear, I'm going to have a two-handed axe, I'm going to wear a sword and a dagger, I'm going to have a bow as well, just in case, and I'm going to wear a shield on my back. Start to think about the insane level of encumbrance, not just carrying the dead weight, but when you want to fight, you've got all these things hanging off you and they're going to get in the way. So I hope that's given you something to think about. Obviously, gaming's there to be fun, whether it's video gaming or role-playing gaming, although I do think particularly in the category of role-playing games, most people who do role-playing games and run role-playing games want them to be a little bit more immersive and in a sense a bit more realistic uh, because it makes the game more interesting, details like this. Okay, so hopefully it's given you something to think about. Hopefully it won't make you too annoyed with whatever video games you're currently playing um, when you see the, the pike or whatever appear on the person's back because they've just drawn their sword. It does annoy me, but I'm trying to live with it. Thanks for watching, as always. Please give us a like and subscribe if you haven't done already. And I'll see you really soon again on the channel for another video here on Scholar Gladiatoria. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.